This is Washington Policy Center's The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Education. We break down the latest in what's happening in education policy for Washington State and how to create the best future for parents and students. Welcome to this episode. My name is Donald Kimball, and I'm here with our Center for Education Director, Liev Finna. We're here to bring you the latest in education. So let's start on the national level. What updates do you have with national education news? Well, I thought it was interesting to that 37 states have passed legislation requiring schools to use what they call the science of reading, which means deep instruction in phonics to teach kids how to read. And it's noteworthy that Washington State is ignoring that movement. It's not on. It's not one of the 37 states, at least uh, going in that direction. And it's it's uh, indicative of the sclerotic, that's the word I looked up today, sclerotic, non-responsive system of public education we have in Washington State. So it's worth talking. It's worth noting. Yeah, it, I was going to say it's kind of a, a trend we see where it feels a lot like the priorities of the legislature oftentimes are not aligned with the priorities of what parents want for education. You see that with them introducing more controversial curriculum, uh, threatening to defund schools who don't adopt that curriculum, and then yes. seeing the test results, as you've highlighted so many times, uh, about our failed English scores, even math, things like that, that are a little bit more fu- foundational uh, that parents want their children taught. And, and Washington doesn't seem super responsive to that. No, no, the, the priorities are not there for uh, educating the children. Um, it's it's all about fighting over money in, in, mm. in the legislature, unfortunately. Yeah, well, and I think we'll see a little bit of that as we move down to the state level. Um, so let's talk about what's going on here. We have a couple of different categories we're going to start with, but let's take a look. We had a, uh, an election recently on, uh, was it Tuesday, the, I want to say 13th, um, that had to do with yes. school bonds. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so there were 21 measures before people across the state to approve expensive school bond construction measures, which would increase local property taxes dramatically and ranging in from a small $250,000 uh, school bond measure to a way up to $650 million, which was in the Tacoma School District. The, the largest one was in the Tacoma School District. And of those 21 measures, uh, only, uh, you know, only seven passed, 14 failed. Wow. Uh, so that, So I have a piece coming out on that next week describing some of the more detail from that. Excellent. And as we talked about, there was that bill that would have increased the, or excuse me, decreased the threshold from 60% down to 50%. But one of the things that you brought up in that piece that I thought was a really good point is that having that extra check helps uh, rule makers be a little bit more fiscally responsible when a bond gets rejected so that they have to find where they can reduce costs. And of course, in the private market with any kind of business or or things like that, you have to, you know, the, the dollars are a little bit more precious to you because they're yours and you have to earn them. And so you make those kinds of considerations. You usually would get multiple quotes or bids or ideas or proposals. So this is kind of a way to incentivize that multiple proposal idea uh, for school bonds. So interesting yes, to, to see that update. And construction is a whole a whole expertise in itself and school districts are not are imperfect at this and have all kinds of grandiose ideas about what they need and want and without without understanding the the actual cost and so this this 60 percent threshold to approve school bonds has protected taxpayers from these you know wild wild eyed dreams of school officials in a very positive and uh, excellent way so there's a feedback from voters yeah, well, and I mean, I mean, I'm I'm prone to that, right? Like my grand ideas, I'm sure, are on my first try, aren't always realistic, and so it's great to have these kinds of mechanisms, whether you're a school district or just a human in regular life. So sometimes all we want is the standards applied to the government that we would apply to ourselves. Great all right, point. so let's move on to some of the uh, legislative happenings. So uh, it sounds like there might be an update on the initiative uh, about parent, parental bill of rights or parental notification. Let's talk about what we're hearing there uh, and murmuring. Yes, so, so so yesterday I heard that the state legislature is not going to hold hearings on the capital gains income tax initiative and on the uh, cap and trade uh, initiative that increased our gas taxes so much which implies heavily that they are going to have hearings on the other four. 
one of which applies to education. That's the Parental Notification Initiative 10 a or 2081. I've written a legislative memo describing what that would do. It's on our website. And it's uh, quite interesting to see that, that, that the legislature uh, thinks it might be important to hold a hearing on that important uh, initiative that over 400,000 people signed, uh, people across the, the political spectrum have signed this initiative. They want parents to be notified about, about the uh, curriculum their kids are learning at school, about any uh, medical services that their children are being referred to for, uh, about records uh, being maintained on their children. And uh, that's clearly something that the people that people from all walks of life want from the schools. And so uh, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, so this isn't a confirmation. They definitely are, but it seems to be leaning that way based on the fact that they've announced they won't hear some and the others have not been announced. So maybe we will have an update for uh, for you on that later. Hopefully it does get a hearing. Hopefully we get a lot of chances to talk about this and bring parents' attention to it and bring, more importantly, attention of legislators to parents on it uh, and, and their views and concerns. Okay, let's move to our next topic here. And this has to do with um, some of the claims that are being made in response to another one of the initiatives that you alluded to, which would be repealing the capital gains tax, the one they call an excise tax, but the rest of the world would rightly call an income tax. Uh, and there was a claim made that if we repealed this capital gains tax, uh, we would devastate some state programs and and education was included in that. So why don't you talk about this and, and we'll do a little brief overview on that. Yes. Yeah, so this is so interesting. So this this week, the uh, Senator Andy Billig came out with what with what appears to be the Democrats talking points against this initiative that would repeal the capital gains income tax in the fall if the people approve it. And his his attack on this initiative which so many people, you know, over, again, over 400,000 people signed. Uh, people don't want a state income tax. I said so 10 times. His attack was to say, you know, preposterously that uh, we expect to get $5.6 billion from that new tax by 2029. And that, if we don't get that, that will devastate public education. Now, that's just like, an absurd thing to say, especially given the fact that we have $19,000 on per student that spending right now on average statewide, especially given the fact that in the last 10 years, we've increased the biennial state budget for education from $13 billion to almost $30 billion. So the schools have never had so much money. And for anyone to say that the schools are being devastated uh, when, when, we, we if if we refuse to pass a new tax is just uh, using children as a political football and it's a scare tactic, fear mongering, uh, par excellence, excellence, however you say that. <laughs> you know, the, the logic makes me think of kind of a joke where I'll be out with friends and maybe we'll be in a mall or shopping or something in a bookstore and you'll see a sale that will say, you know, buy two books and get five dollars off the second. And then you're like, well, I have to buy it because I'm losing five dollars otherwise. You know, that's the, that's the rationale being given here. It's this money that you don't have yet. And then you're you're pre-assigning, and then when you don't get it because it's not yours, you think, well, now we've lost all this money, and and we're devastated, for, which is which is very silly. Uh, maybe legislature math ought to get in tandem with real math a little bit here. But uh, like yeah, it's silly. It's silly. I mean, yeah. it's just silly. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I the other thing I do did want to highlight that you mentioned too is they, they are using students again as sort of this you know bait and switch, using them as the victims. Uh, when clearly there are a lot of other policies they could be doing to help children out. We've seen that spending money doesn't always equate to better outcomes. And in fact, in, in most cases, it seems not to have any kind of an impact. And so there are actual reforms we could do, such as school choice, to help students. But that's not necessarily where the legislature wants to go. They always want to complain when it's about the money. Yeah. So when they're they're trying to defend their programs, they say, oh, we need the money for the children. And then when the parents say, well, we'd like to have some of that money so we can do what you're failing to do for us, that is educate our children to minimum state standards. They say, oh, no. So that just tells you it's a system defending its own, uh, you know, monopoly and protecting its uh, power and funding in this. So it's pretty and transparent. 
and they'll use students, they'll use teachers, like you've also pointed out in the past, where when there's any sort of funding thing, they'll say, oh, we're going to have to cut teachers. But of course, they've hired a ton of administrators, you know, right before then. So it's it's always the it's always a political yes. game of tug of war. Yes, yes, it really is. OK, so we'll move on. I believe Paul uh, Guppy, our senior vice president for research, is also going to have some expanded comments on this uh, on his legislative update. So check out this week's legislative update from Paul Guppy to hear more on that. Uh, he also has a blog posted. Yeah, yep. I was going to mention that he has a really good blog posted on this with charts and graphs and explanation over why this makes no sense. This claim. Yep. So go to WashingtonPolicy.org and check out the blog there for that. Um, and then you can also go to the publications tab while you're there and check out Leaves other great work there. So last two things we'll talk about here real quickly in the last uh, few minutes. We have two testimonies that you've given. So let's talk about those. Uh, the first one I believe we wanted to talk about had to do with this making um, hate speech a crime. Is that right? Yes, there's a bill. Five, it said a bill, 5472, uh, I believe it is. I would, five, I'm sorry, five, Senate Bill 5427. Uh, is a very bad bill that started out, remember, with the $2,000 reward to report your neighbor for having some, some supposedly expressed something hateful. And they, they were so embarrassed by the outrage against the, uh, the government rewarding people for turning in their neighbors that they pulled the $2,000 part out, but they're still proceeding to pass this bill. They passed it in the Senate, and this, and this morning it was before the House uh, Judiciary and Civil Rights Committee, and there was a very good discussion. Uh, and it it appeared that some of the Democratic members, including the chair, were concerned about the broad sweep of bringing in sort of innocent people that are not intending anything uh, threatening or harmful uh, by making by saying something that was perceived to be offensive by somebody else. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, that uh, they want to criminalize words for just uh, some for hurting somebody's feelings, essentially. That apparently, Oregon has got a um, such a hate uh, speech hotline, and uh, they. But but our the bill that is before this our legislature would allow the referral of uh, by the AG to uh, local prosecutors, local law enforcement for reports made by a student, let's say in, in high school saying, uh, so-and-so is a nasty so-and-so. That could be considered hate speech and and the attorney general could turn the local prosecutors on this kid, this hapless kid who didn't mean anything by it, who didn't threaten anything. And this, of course, is divisive and harmful, harmful to our society. And uh, there was a very robust discussion. I, I know that gets my hopes up that the bill will fail. Who knows? Uh, this legislature it seems to be uh, caught up in its misunderstanding of what the First Amendment requires. You know, we have that's one of our prime civil rights. This was the civil rights committee. Uh, yeah. So we'll see what happens. So I want to really quickly play out that scenario you mentioned. You know, let's say a student does say something mean and heinous. And the first thought that maybe a lot of people have thinking maybe back on their high school experience is, well, kids are mean. Kids are nasty. And that is true. And kids can say some very hurtful, harmful things. Absolutely. But then let's put the shoe on the other foot for a minute and realize that if kids are in fact nasty and mean, how much more are they going to abuse a system that lets them call in threats against someone else to set them up? We've already seen the online prevalence of uh, swatting, which is the practice of people calling in SWAT teams on people live streaming across the internet for, for no reason. You know, They'll call and say, oh, someone's got a hostage or they have a meth lab set up and a SWAT team will come down, totally disrupt. It's scarring, it's terrible. So we know that that kids are are capable of this kind of thing. So all we're doing by setting up a lower standard for something like this is to create an incentive for kids to report other people, uh, report other students, other teachers, if they don't like them for saying something without any standard of evidence and then making that, you know, have potential criminal applications. So Absolutely. Even, even as students can be mean and nasty and say mean things, they will, they, they will very much have the ability to abuse a system set up that's maybe at its best intended to do good. Well, I think your point is so excellent. And I wanted to say this to I me. Mean, we have one minute to testify and, you know, I'm remote. It's difficult to get everything in. But it occurred to me that that uh, this bill is really naive. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's almost like opening a Pandora's box. Do people not understand what human nature is about? 
You, you pass a law that encourages you to look at your neighbor through the lens of hate and distrust and suspicion. What do you think is going to happen? More of this incidents will be reported. And then what are they going to do? They're going to use these numbers to justify more of a clampdown on our society. Yeah. Anyway, so this is as obvious as the day is long. And I, so I actually think that the committee was actually hearing what we were saying. But of course, they'd like to wrap themselves up in this, you know, we're going to, we're going to change human nature. We're, yes. we're going <laughs> to... Well, and as, uh, you know, as I think it was Solzhenitsyn said, you know, the heart of, of uh, good and evil, you know, divides the heart of every man. And it's like, we all have this, but but we're not going to get rid of it. We're not going to move away from it. So, you know, yes. we, we have systems in place, like you said, for actual criminal intent and criminal behaviors, and we should probably utilize those better. Uh, yes. We could talk about this forever. I do want to get really quickly to the last uh, testimony you made, uh, which is about restricting information in voter pamphlets. Let, why don't you fill us in on that and the implications for education? Yeah, well, this is another awful bill called House Bill 1272, which would require voters pamphlets uh, that that, that have produced pro and con statements for measures for school board bonds and such like that uh, to, you know, to only allow residents in their community to write the pro and con statements, which is an which is an effort to restrict the free flow of information in our society, where the you know the computer now gives us access to information across boundary lines. So they're putting they're imposing a residency requirement to write uh, statements on the voters pamphlet, which is a clear uh, intrusion into our system of elections and, and anti-democratic and censorship. And there were a lot of people testifying against this bill, but I, I'm afraid that the committee appeared pretty determined to pass it. But I think it fails on its merits. I mean, a residency requirement to write a description for a voters pamphlet, it comes very close to a, uh, a restriction on your right to have every piece of information you need to vote. It's getting very right. close to taking away your full and fair knowledge of what you're voting on by the government. So, I, you know, well, there's a couple bill. of yeah, there's a couple of things that stick out to me. One, it does seem like the other bill a little naive, as though we're living in the 1950s when you couldn't just transmit information. So, you know, if let's say that uh, an organization who who's submitting this, they, they have one person who lives in one district, they're just going to find people in all the other districts to write similar things and paraphrase. Heck, you could run it through chat GPT these days to change it up enough uh, so that it looks different. So one, it's just naive. It just adds inconvenience. But two, it's also just very obviously trying to restrict the amount of information given. We look to other states for examples of good policy that we can apply here because we want to find solutions that work. And it doesn't matter if you're here locally or not. Being local can give you some insight into nuances and new perspectives, but it doesn't necessarily mean the other ideas are bad. I don't need a doctor to help cure my illness uh, from the same city as me. It might, he might, you know, a, a local doctor might know, oh, you, you got this because of some air pollution thing we had. That might be helpful, but I want the best doctor. It doesn't matter where they're from. So a, a very silly rejection of, uh, or excuse me, restriction on information uh, distribution does not make a lot of sense in my book. It, no, it doesn't, especially when it comes to the election, when yes. it comes to elections. I mean, this is like key to our democratic society to allow for free and open debate, discussion and learning from your neighbor. And the right to learn and listen is 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 a uh, you know fundamental of, to, for us all to be informed citizens in the vote. So it's just it's absolutely a bad thing. Okay, bad thing. well, thank you. So we'll we'll keep you updated on that and see. Hopefully, um, there's movement one way or the other. We hope movement goes certain directions on these, but we yeah. will keep you up to date. And uh, we hope you have a happy holiday weekend. Yes, you too. Thank you, Donald.